Well, good afternoon. It's exactly 3.45, and I promise to finish at exactly or before 4.45. Uh, my name is Steve Parks. Uh, this talk is how to run a Drupal agency. If you are here to find out about the Drupal render pipeline, you're in the wrong room. So now is your chance to shift. Uh, you might prefer to hear about that anyway. It's upstairs. So I'm from a company called Wanda. We're the largest Drupal agency in Europe, but not doing too much yet in the States. That may change in the future. Um, and as I say, the talk is on how to run a Drupal agency. Now, the prime focus for this talk is uh, those people who are in management positions in a Drupal agency already and want to grow it or deal with some of the issues they're facing, or those who would like to run a Drupal agency. But there are uh, secondary audiences to this talk. Those who work in Drupal agencies and want to understand the part they can play and the way that things work kind of up top. And those who are contractors or freelancers and want to understand a little bit more about the business of agencies and whether that's something that they could do themselves as well. Uh, now, I want to just stress that, like everybody in this room, I am an absolute expert at this topic. There is that disclaimer. So this is just literally uh, the stuff that I've tried, the stuff that I've failed at, some stuff that's worked, and it's sharing it. We do have a policy within Wonder of uh, extreme transparency, and the policy is open by default. So we're willing to share practically anything except our HR records, for example. But anything else is out there to share. Uh, and I'll provide you with the URL of where you can download all the sorts of tools and resources that we develop. But before I get on to anything geeky, I want to take you on a road trip. LA, California, it's beautiful, isn't it? I arrived uh, last week and I decided to rent a car and travel up into the mountains. Uh, and I went up to the Sequoia National Park. It was an amazing place. Uh, driving up the mountain roads with all these huge trees growing up by the side, getting higher and higher, get, feeling the air get thinner, and uh, the freshness of the air as well. It was such a beautiful experience and such a great drive. But these sequoia trees are quite incredible. They are the world's largest living thing by volume. And they grow to some incredible heights, but also some incredible widths. So for example, this is the General Sherman tree in the Sequoia National Park. And it is huge. I mean, the photo almost can't do justice, but look at a normal tree to the right and then look at the tree, look at the, the General Sherman. It's huge. This is the largest living thing by volume on the planet. This actual tree, the General Sherman, it's enormous. Um, and uh, all the trees in the forest are absolutely amazing, and the longevity as well. This tree is 2,200 years old. 2,200 years old. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could know that our businesses could last as long and be as durable? And if we took a cross-section through a tree like this, this is a tree of kind of almost the same age, but just counting the rings, and you think of the history that it's seen, the troubles that it's been through, uh, all of the adverse uh, influences from the weather or fire or whatever else, but it's survived as old as that uh, um, until this fateful moment. Um, so if we took a slice through a Drupal agency, I wanted to kind of have a feel of what we would see. What is it that makes up a Drupal agency? Uh, and I think there are these things. Um, so first of all, clients, team, and tools are, are equally important. Um, clients and team are fairly self-explanatory. Tools, um, kind of think of it as like a carpenter's tools. Yes, he does have all sorts of tools to use, but it's also his knowledge, his technique, his expertise. It's these things together that make an agency of any kind or a professional services firm. And these things together that form the brand. Don't think of the brand as a logo. The brand is everything that you mean as an organization. And we're going to step through each of these uh, within this session. So let's first of all focus on clients. Um, now, the sections in this, we're going to look at selecting the right clients, because that's really important, establishing a solid and equal relationship with the clients, the billing principles, and managing the account. And we as Drupal agencies tend to be pretty bad at all this stuff. We're in a very, very lucky position where for years, Clients have just come knocking on our door. We're the lucky. Can't turn up and go, oh, yeah, we want Drupal. Uh, we hear it's the cool thing. Uh, we need a Drupal agency. But the thing is, the Drupal world is going to get a lot more competitive. It already is. Look at the size of this conference. Look at some of the companies that are moving into the space. 
And we're seeing now professional digital agencies who have been around for years, who are adding Drupal to their list. We as an industry need to step up and adopt more professional processes, but also we need to be better at satisfying our clients. We've kind of had a little bit of arrogance, haven't we, in the Drupal world, like, yeah, we're Drupal, I'm a Drupal rock star, we're amazing, uh, but not so great at the customer service and holding the customer's hand through the process. So first of all, let's start with selecting uh, the clients. Now, uh, a great agency knows that they're defined by the word no more than anything else. It's about that selectivity. It's about really knowing what you are for as an agency. What are you the best in the world at and which clients should you select to support that? If you're not as selective with the clients as the clients are with you, then you've got a problem. You're just taking any work that comes in. And that's going to lead to problems for you. It's going to lead to problems for the clients. It's going to lead to unhappy relationships. So it's really important that you are selective with your clients. I know it's hard when the phone rings or that email comes in and goes, yeah, we've got a great project for you. Come in and talk to us. Uh, it's so exciting. But is that really the right project you should be taking on to grow your agency to the next level? So you need to know what your kind of client is. For your agency, what would be the dream client? What kind of clients do you want? And select and stick to selecting only those. Now for, for us, it's these. Now it's a, a lot of words on a slide. I'm not gonna go through them. This slide is mainly here for if you just want to download the slides from the talk page afterwards and review these or watch the talk online. They're also available on our site. We pu very publicly talk about the right kind of clients for us. Um, but one of the key things at the bottom there, be willing to work in an open and transparent way. So we assess our potential clients from this list. And we're thinking about, are they a good fit with us? Because if not, it leads to a whole load of pain. Not just for us as a business, but for our individual staff members and for the clients themselves. So uh, knowing the kind of client you want to have, you then take them through a sales process. Now at first, you get the initial contact, whether that's an RFP or you have an idea about who you might like to serve. And you have to make a stop-go decision, then and there, as early as possible. Too much time is wasted by Drupal agencies, and any agency, in chasing sales that A, they can't win, or B, they shouldn't want huge amount of wasted time. And one of the biggest differences you can make in your business in terms of making your time more productive is being more selective about the RFPs you respond to or the customer inquiries. How many frustrating days have you had writing proposals, going to pitch, and at the end to get that rejection email and go, oh, well, I knew we wouldn't get it anyway. And <laughs> you could have saved all of that time. Think how much that's worth. So the stop-go decision, this is how we do it. We just have this spreadsheet where we're assessing some of those things. Again, the print's quite small. It's designed for if you want to review the materials that you download afterwards. Um, but we're assessing things like uh, the procurement process is reasonable for the project size. Have you ever found that not to be the case? <laughs> we have a kind of rough rule of thumb, which is one page of proposal, one page of RFP, for every 10 grand or every 10,000 of budget. So uh, if you've got a client that's you know, pitching a 50,000 pound budget to you and they've got a 200 page RFP, walk away. Um, so, <laughs> um, so that's a good point for clients as well because it's wasting the client's time, all of this as well. And we're checking things, the project delivery time scale is reasonable. Um, and our resourcing things, we have the right people available for the dates and so on. There's a lot else that we're checking. We have two people review the RFP or the opportunity uh, and score it on this basis. And at the bottom, it comes out with a score, but that is not a decision. The automated calculated score is not a decision. It's a starting point for a conversation. And we have that conversation, and then the humans decide whether it's a go or no go. You can't have some spreadsheet that decides what business you're gonna pitch. Because at the end of the day, there's an amount of gut feel, or there's you know what's in the pipeline or whatever. And one day, you know, a total score of you know, 72 might be a go, another day it may be a no-go because you're too busy. So you, you can be as selective as you need to be. But it's a starting point for a conversation. 
So have this kind of formal process where you are assessing the opportunities you get and you're scoring the client. Because you know what, when you send your proposal, they will score you like this. Wh why shouldn't it be equal? It should be uh, an equal approach between client and supplier all of the time. So back to the sales process. We've done the stop-go decision. We've run that spreadsheet and we've decided that this is a go. Next, you come to discovery. Don't leave this for starting the project. Don't just automatically read the RFP and assume that's the extent of the information. In the discovery and the sales process, you want to really understand who this client is and who the key people at the client are. You want to be knowing who are we trying to impress with this? Who are we trying to connect with? What buying power do they have? What are their worries? What is their background? So you want to build up a little map of the people on the client side that you know you'll be dealing with and what matters to them. What are their kind of key motivators? And uh, also, you want to be discovering about the project. What is the history of the project? What's involved? What are the unknowns? And map out the risks as well. So that discovery phase is really important. Then you want to have the prepare and prove stage. Now, it's very important that there's both words. You're preparing to pitch for this, but you also have to create proof. So in the preparing stage, what you're doing is you are understanding what is involved in the project, and then you need to provide actual proof that you can do that. And it's amazing how often we don't do that as agencies. We just go, oh yeah, you need to download this module, you need to do that, you need to do the other, and we'll do that for you, and here's the price. Whereas what, you, what the client is wanting is they've got a number of worries in their mind. They might be worrying, is this agency large enough to handle this project? Or is this agency too big to care about us as a small customer? You know, do they really have Drupal experience? Do they have experience in our sector? So in the prepare and prove, think about what their worries are and then think about what proof you can provide to answer those. Then you write the proposal and possibly also do a presentation. Those I will leave out of scope for this talk today. But then you come to the agreement. And this is really key, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on. But it's, it's an agreement. I call it an agreement rather than a contract because it has to be an agreement. Both parties have to be in agreement, and it has to be equal. But it has to state really clearly what the parameters of the project are and set the expectations. And all too often, the sales process tends to stop just before then you get the email saying, congratulations, we've selected you. And you get all overexcited, and you rush into the first meetings, and you start delivering. You have to make sure that there is a proper agreement in place. You know, because the relationship seems fantastic now, but you want a framework for this is how we are going to work together. Then you want an internal retrospective, so you can learn from each sale that you do. And then you want to get the project set up for delivery. But never skip out the retrospective stage. It's exciting to get a new sale but you have to learn from it, continuously learn all of the time. So once you have the client one, you need to establish a relationship. And I can't emphasize enough how much the equal nature of the relationship matters. Too many client-vendor relationships are abusive, Abu based on abusive relationships, where one partner is kind of kept down and under the whip, and the client is there, I've got the budget, you do whatever I say. Uh, and the agency has the experience and has the knowledge and may know from previous experience what the best direction is, but the client has the budget. The budget does not outweigh your expertise and experience. The client is hiring you because you are expert and experienced and can deliver what they need. That has an equal weight. That is why they are paying you that money. They're not saying, you know what, we'll pay those people a lot more than they're worth. They are paying you this amount because you are worth that amount. That's an equal relationship. We get too hung up on money talking. Money is just one half of the equation. There needs to be a quality in the relationship. And that means both parties need to have input into all the key decisions. Uh, both parties need to have open communications and collaboration. Um, all the way through, it has to be an equal approach to the project. But you do have to have this relationship defined. Now, this can be in the contract, but also I really recommend doing a client onboarding process, just as you would with a new staff member. Because the client doesn't know all of your processes and approaches and the, you know, the way that you do things. 
that you just suddenly turn up and you start hacking away at stuff. Do a client onboarding process so they know what to expect, so that you are setting the parameters for the relationship. You may even need to do client training because we only do agile projects. We at the start of all projects um, do two days of agile training with clients to make sure that we're all on the same page with the language we're going to use, the methods we're going to use, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and all of this is to set the expectations, which is really important, and it's what we mostly fail at most of the time. When projects go wrong, when clients are unhappy, it generally comes down to miscommunication and the missetting of expectations. And also what's impo important is think of this zipper effect. Normally, in a project, you have project manager talking to project manager, and none of the others talk to each other. You want a zipper effect, everyone talking to each other. You want to engage from a stakeholder level, project manager level, developer level, all the way, you know, all points of the zipper, you want to be connecting, uh, because that creates a really strong bond and good communications. Boom. <sighs> Boom. We price ourselves too cheaply as an industry. Uh, we don't value the work that's being done, and that means that it's really difficult for Drupal agencies to reinvest in good processes and good training and good development. So make sure that you're setting the right billing terms for your agency, the right billing rates uh, and the right payment terms. Don't let clients make this an unequal relationship. Make sure that the client is paying properly for what you are delivering, the level of experience. And make sure also that they're paying you on time because that's just simple respect. At the point of invoice, that's your money. You've earned it. They don't pay their salaries though. You need to be paid on time. And enforce that as a matter of respect. Stop projects if invoices become late. Pause things. Um, they'll soon get paid. It's just a simple matter of that equality, the trust and respect. So the relationship is key. Uh, other things with the billing. Um, uh, billing by hours is really inefficient and complicated. You've got the context switching all the time. You've got developers constantly thinking, now, what was I doing there and what was going on there? Um, clients should be booking on, on any reasonably large project. Clients should be booking people by the day or even by the sprint. We sell sprints, effectively. And you know for the project, okay, we're going to have 16 two-week sprints, and each sprint is going to be costing this much. Uh, and therefore, here is the project budget, here's the budget burn down, here's how we're going to bill. And we bill at the end of each sprint. So at the end of each sprint, we have a sign-off with the client, and when they've signed off, the invoice goes out, and they've then got 30 days payment terms. And that means the client has always real visibility on how the project budget is doing, because that reassures them as well, actually. We find clients like this because they have visibility, transparency all the time. Um, and don't undervalue your talented people. We keep doing that. We keep underbilling uh, as an industry. Uh, the, the one thing you can do, though, clients uh, who are good clients, you can reward them with discounts, because if they can help you improve your utilization, that is the percentage of potentially billable time that can actually be billed, if they can help you improve that by, say, committing to booking 10 sprints or whatever it is, then you can offer better rates. But it's a trade. It's an equal trade. If you help us improve utilization, we'll provide a discount. That's the way that the discounts can work. Never offer just a discount because they ask for one. Because what you're instantly doing then is saying, yeah, we're not worth as much as we said we were. That's fine. Um, so stick, you know, you've got a rate. Never offer discounts for no reason. So if a client needs a discount to fit their budget, then you have to negotiate what comes out. It's all back to this mutual respect and trust, this equal relationship that sets things up fairly and honestly. This is the thing that we are worst at as agencies, and it's sometimes embarrassing. Because um, we kind of win the client, and then we bury our heads in our laptops, and we download a load of modules, and we hack it all together. And ta-da! Um, you really need to manage client accounts, and clients want this. We've actually been seeing RFPs recently where the clients specify that they need this because they have been burned. Uh, and this account management is just simply someone who's taking a higher level view of the relationship with the client. So we appoint from our side a project director to each project. And their job is not to get involved in the day to day, ever. Not to do all the stuff relating to the project, but simply to engage with the stakeholders on a regular basis at the client side, 
and also to keep an overview on what our team is doing and any issues and blockers and things that are coming up that should create alarm bells and to check that we are following our ways of doing things and the correct processes. So they have regular reviews with the client, which we call steering groups. Once every other sprint, they have a steering group with the client, and they meet the client's senior stakeholders, and they run through a standard slide deck about the project, which is covering the budget, it's covering the timeline, it's covering the risks, it's covering the, you know, the, uh, all the changes that have come into the project, it's covering all sorts of things that are relevant to the high-level stakeholders. Um, so that kind of regular review, that steering group, is really valuable in building that relationship. Uh, and you're always, of course, looking to demonstrate your expertise. Um, because th that's the thing, the clients, and we hear this again and again, um, that the clients will often say, oh, the previous agency just came in and they did the job fine, but they didn't give us you know, any kind of steering or advice. They didn't give us any ideas. We got nothing from them. They, they just built the site. The clients are really thirsty. The digital world uh, is so complex. There are so many things going on all the time. They feel a bit lost. I mean, face it, if we're honest, sometimes we feel a bit lost. <laughs> so, and we're, we're the experts working in it every day, and there's always something new. So your job is to be their radar, scanning the horizon, looking at what's coming up, what they could do. So for example, this Google, uh, Google Mobile Geddon update recently, you should know about that, and you should be flagging it up to your clients well in advance and suggesting they prioritize uh, getting their sites ready for that and demonstrating why. So that kind of expert advice is really highly valued by clients. Um, the other thing it's really important to remember is that no customer is forever. And I know it's hard to grasp for us uh, as agencies because we think, oh, we're the best in the world. Why would they go anywhere else? We're amazing. Look how much fun we have. Um, but it happens. They will get a new person at their end uh, who will want to make their own mark on the project, or they will just have different expectations, or something will happen, and people want change after a couple of years anyway. So even if you've been amazing, change will come. But also, you may change as an agency, and you should be. The clients you won three, five years ago may not be the clients you should have next year or the year after. There's a time to move on on either side. And you should constantly be reviewing your client list and seeing, are these necessarily our right clients now? If you started as a five-person agency, when you're a 50-person agency, you're probably not the best person for the first clients you want. And you may be running around like crazy, dealing with really small bits and pieces uh, and in not giving them the best service. So be ready for that change and reviewing and pruning that client list. It's best for the client and it's best for you but do manage it smoothly, find them another good agency um, and help them through. And even if they've fired you, give them time and help them transition in a really professional way. So we've talked about for the clients, selecting the right clients, establishing a solid and equal relationship, setting clear billing principles and managing the account. That's the clients section. Let's look at the team. And these are the sections that we're gonna be covering uh, in this part. The right person is key. Um, we, again, it's a Drupal thing. We would hire people like, oh my God, they're a Drupal rock star. We've got to get them. They're, they may be amazing, but they may not be the right fit for you as a company because what you need to be recruiting for mostly is character because you, you can't change that. You can train people, you can develop people. If you get people who are kind of middleweight Drupal developers, you can provide them so much training and support and resources and mentoring from others in the, the company. But if someone just doesn't fit the culture, that's a much trickier thing. And it's important to recognize that. So recruit for that at the start. And that means knowing the kind of person that is a your kind of person that fits the agency culture. So, you know, it's, it's like, for example, somebody who works at Google would probably hate working at Microsoft. And yet, they're not a bad person. They're an amazing person. And somebody who works at Microsoft would probably hate working at Google. And they're a great person. So this is not about whether someone is amazing. This is just about whether someone fits your culture. And there are very different cultures in different companies. And there should be. 
it's a sign of a really good, strong culture if there are some people who would hate it and not get in. That's actually a sign you've created something strong and durable and lasting. So with every recruit, you are building the culture of your company. Matt Mullenweg at WordPress personally interviews every new recruit because he knows this is true. He is building the culture of Automatic. So therefore, it's better to be really selective. Don't just hire people because they're available and you've got potential projects. Hire people only when they really do fit your culture and it would be better to slow down your growth than take on people who aren't right. As part of the recruitment process, we have a policy. We never, ever use recruitment agents because they do not have the same incentives as you do for getting the right people. They just want to get someone in the role so they can bill you, and six months later, they'll be ringing up that person and trying to get them to move somewhere else. So uh, we don't use them. We put it all over our job ads. We have a special web page explaining why we don't use Drupal agents, and it's being shared a lot. However, every week I get an email or a call from recruitment agents saying, I know you don't use recruitment agents, but, <laughs> and they have some reason why they're supposed to be different, but it just doesn't work for us. It's that personal connection. You need to be responsible for the people in your company, not outsourcing it somewhere else. It's only you. So therefore, what you need to do is have a process that you use for bringing these people on board and a process that you use for people to be able to find out that there are vacancies. So think of all the places that you're going to advertise. So instead of that paying that fat fee for a recruitment agent, how are you going to use that potential fee to advertise for people and spread the word widely? There are lots of great people out there looking for jobs. Use your networks. Uh, use all sorts of ways to track them down. But then you need a good process for selecting people. Now, because our culture is such a strong thing for us, our approach is a peer interview. So uh, a manager, so for example, me in the UK or for a consulting business, I will meet with someone and interview them, but that's pretty short. We then have someone who does exactly the same job as them, spend an hour and a half or so with them, talking much more in depth. And again, it's equal. Like the client agency thing, this isn't us interviewing them. We want it to be them interviewing us as well. And we want them to get a feel of what the company is really like. And they can only do that if they're talking to someone who does a similar job at a similar level. So match them up with someone similar uh, and do the interview for that. There are other companies that use videos. They get, I know Lullabot uh, get people to submit YouTube videos. They've talked about that, and that's been very successful for them. Um, and all sorts of ways that you can use to just you know, check, is this person right for me? Now, for our culture, the kind of person that's right for us is someone who is uh, uh, really keen on learning, really curious, always keen to learn more stuff, always got side projects, someone who's a great communicator. There isn't anybody in our company I wouldn't be happy to put in front of the chief executive of any one of our clients. So someone who is a great communicator and someone who is very professional. They care about the detail, they care about the job that we do, how we're perceived, uh, the results that the client gets. They've got that professional approach and they want to have the professional tools to get that. So one way you can do is uh, give people a chance to try out. Um, at some companies, I think Automatic are the same with this as well. They give people a chance to do a small project for them in evenings or weekends, just a really small task, just to see how it's done. And they pay them for it. But it's a chance for that person to check out do they like working for Automatic, and for Automatic to check out do we like this person. So you've got to be very selective on that. Sticky subject next. Tricky. Pain. Okay, let's be open about this. Let's be frank. We don't talk about money much, um, but there are some ways that uh, agencies structure their rates and structure things that are done. And I think it's really important. And as Drupal agencies, we tend to overlook it a bit. Uh, and we end up with kind of very squeezed margins, which creates unstable businesses. So this is kind of a good rule of thumb. This is not an absolute rule. It's a rule of thumb, but the pay package for staff should be roughly a third of their likely billing for a year. I'll come on to why in a moment. Um, and that, you know, there's a quick formula there, but essentially it's saying 176 days times the day rate divided by three gives you a good rule of thumb guideline. There are many other things that you may want to factor into that, but that gives a fairly good guideline. 
And this is because this is how the finances of your company should be structured, to have a healthy agency that can survive and weather the storms. Team costs, uh, so imagine you're billing on a project. Team costs should be about a third of what you're billing, the direct team costs. The rest should be a contribution to overheads. Uh, uh, another third should be a contribution to overheads. This is funding all of your training. It's funding offices if you have them. It's funding the laptops. It's funding trips to DrupalCon. It's funding all the stuff that makes you what you are. And also the management overhead, the support for the staff. It's uh, the expertise that they can call on within the company. So all of that stuff that is their backup. And this is what makes an agency. Because if you don't invest in all that, you're just freelancing. As an agency, as a company, you're investing in a team of people and you're investing in the support and the resources for that team to do a great job. And then you need a third allocated to contingency and profit um, because you have to make sure you have good margins because times will not always be good. We'll come on to some of the problems in a moment, but that, that third uh, is a good metric to aim for. That will boil down to, at the end of the day, it won't boil down to making that amount of profit at the end of the year because there'll always be other stuff, but it gives that contingency. For profit levels themselves, your net profit as a company, if you're making 10% or less, you're in trouble. That's going to lead to cash flow problems. 10% net profit a year or less. 10 to 15%, okay. 15 to 20% is good, that's, that's fine. 20%, you're amazing, or more. Um, so, yeah, so you want to be in the 10 to 20 range at least. Under 10%, you really need to start addressing uh, the way you structure and run the company because you are if you hit a problem, you're done for. Um, so you need to be making that profit. It is the responsible thing to do for your staff and for your clients. Your clients do not want you to suddenly go bust or to be too focused on a cash flow problem to sort their problems out. Your staff want job security and they deserve it for working hard. So do make sure that there is a good profit being made. Then when you have the staff, you need to make sure you're not making lots of stupid rules. Because, uh, again, it's really tempting, particularly we, coming fr if anyone comes from a technical background, it's all too easy to fall into this idea that humans are program programmable. And if we just create a big list of rules that we do in the company, then everyone will go away and do that. So you need to be setting people free, hiring really talented people and setting them free to do their job really well. You are hiring knowledge workers, after all. This is not some factory in the 1920s or whatever it is. This is modern day, highly educated workforce, highly trained, highly experienced knowledge workers. Use their brains. Set them free. Set parameters uh, that they can work within, but not lots of rules. And the main rule is that it's your job to look after the team. They will look after the customers, you focus on looking after them. And so much of your time as a manager, or as a leader of the business, needs to be focused on looking after the team. And then let them look after the customers. So rounding up the team section, these are the points that, uh, that we've covered there. So let's move on to the tools section. Now this is again what differentiates really good professional services companies, really good agencies from those that just kind of tick along. In that, you know, a lot of agencies, they just have the, the kind of team and the clients and then the tools is a fairly random thing. You know, it's fairly random. Yeah, we use Drupal or whatever. Uh, but if you can develop a way of doing things in your company, uh, it can really transform you. So let's take a look in this section. Um, documenting the way you do things. We have um, put a lot of effort into this. We fly people from all the different countries to a retreat somewhere. We have a great time, yeah? There may be a bit of beer drink, maybe a bit of whiskey, but we work very hard and we really capture what we do. We get all the project managers together, all the consultants, and we document what it is that we do as a business and how we want to do it. It's not management saying this, it's the teams getting together and deciding this is the way we will do stuff. And it's been so valuable in the business because then that's a resource for training new people. And it's also a way of explaining to the client, this is how we do the thing we do. And this is why we are great. This is why you should hire us. We actually make this public. I'll give you the URL later on. And it's uh, Creative Commons. So if anyone wants to copy it for their agency, go ahead. 
we want to be as open with our business as we are with software in the Cooper community and want to share everything. So we have actually won business purely because of well-documented processes. We had one large client recently who just said, I've seen the way you do stuff. It's music to my ears because we've had so many agencies coming in and just doing stuff. But you have this process. So if you document the way things work, then it's a really persuasive thing for clients as well as giving a stable base to your business. Um, in terms of other tools, just use the simplest things that work. One of the things I keep seeing is as we're Drupal agencies, we think we need a system to manage our clients and our billing. Let's build it in Drupal. <laughs> no. uh, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, because so much time is absorbed on internal projects and that time just vanishes into the ether. It's unbillable and it seems to never end because there is no client saying that's you're spending too much on this. So use the simplest things that work. There are great tools out there that agencies use, whether it's Harvest for time billing or Trello for a simple board of cards. We actually, so we manage the group board at Wondercrowd is managed in an agile way and we're all we're working one month sprints with weekly stand-ups and we just use Trello for managing all of the stuff we're changing in the business. That's all it needs. Use the simplest things that work. Um, and there are, there are so many tools there and share with other Drupal agencies what you use and what works well. Train people in these things and then all the way through measure, track and report. Now if you have the way that you do stuff you can all the time review, are we doing this? In every retrospective on every project or in every retrospective on a sale, are we doing this the way that we said we would? Can we improve the way that we do things? Uh, and what can we implement now? Um, and then you can continuously improve that. Now, I wonder, our tools are managed by this man. He is a wonderful man. He deserves a name check. Steve Hunton has, uh, is the kind of keeper of the Wonder Way, and he works across all our countries now sharing that experience and helping knowledge move between the countries. And he has taken the entire way we work to be through being ISO, 97, ISO 9001 certified. So it's a quality standard that clients recognize, saying, yes, we do do this stuff. Now, I know that sounds very serious, so I want to show you that Steve Hunton is not always serious. So this is him at weekends. Um, and so that's the tools. Document the way you do things. Develop a process. A great example of this is we decided recently that all of our countries have kind of evolved the discovery process on projects in different ways. And there were all sorts of good ideas around, but it needed unifying. So we flew everyone together for two days of working on this, and we developed the wonder way of doing discovery. And again, that's going to be shared out as well. But it's the stuff that really works, developing all these modules can be put together into a dis good discovery process. And that tool then creates value for the clients because they know that whoever they get on their project knows how to do a discovery process the same as anyone else and will follow through the same tools and the same processes and has been trained in delivering that discovery. And they know that they it's going to be delivered efficiently because you're not making it up as you go along all the time. So having these tools is a really valuable thing to do to create a good agency. Then we get on to the brand. Now, the brand is kind of a mixture of all of these things. And the brand is not about the logo. The brand is kind of who you are as a company, how you are perceived. You need to differentiate yourself in a market where everybody looks the same. That differentiation is, is key. Because from the client's point of view, a web agency, is a web agency, is a web agency. Why are you different? Why should they hire you? Now for us, we tend to, we try to focus on delivery being the differentiator, which shouldn't be a competing factor in our industry, but in the, in the UK at the moment, it is. Um, but delivery uh, and the processes that we use is a differentiator, so we focus on that. What is it for you? What makes you the best in the world and what you do? Now, Dries has spoken before about focusing on a real niche, or as we say in the US, niche. Um, and, um, you know, so whether that is uh, very scalable Drupal sites, you know, huge amounts of traffic, 
or whether it is for a you know, uh, marketing automation focused site. What is your area of expertise? That could be a sector, it could be a particular range of skills, it could be a way that you approach things, or it could just be that you're really fun to work with and you want to pitch at the creative industries, so your USP is that you're fun. So what is your differentiator? And it will come from all of those three things around the outside, the client, the team, and the tools. Somewhere in the middle there will be your differentiator. Think about what that is. And then the name of your company, the branding. People get far too hung up on this. Uh, it, it, you, know, you make the name what you want it to mean. It doesn't need to start being amazing. Think of some of the, the big brands in the world, Walmart, things like that. Uh, when you st if you had a big branding session and sat down and said, yeah, we're going to call this Walmart, uh, would everyone go, oh my God, that's an amazing name, it's so cool. Uh, no. Uh, so it doesn't matter for you. Sometimes the simplest things work best. Keep it simple. No need to go over the top with these cool, fancy names. And the main thing that matters, way more than the actual name or anything like that, is that sense of purpose. That comes out of your differentiator. It comes out of the real want to do something different. And it's what will motivate you every day. And it's what will motivate your team. And it's what will motivate your clients. That sense of purpose. That sense of you are going to do something great for them and they're gonna love you for it. What is your purpose? Find your purpose, and that's one of the key things uh, about making your agency different. So uh, it's a very short section on brand, uh, and now, not everything always goes smoothly. For the redwood trees, as much as for a Drupal agency, forest fires can sweep through, problems out of your control. Now the trees are very hardy at dealing with this. Here you can see some of the, you know, thousand, well, hundreds towards a thousand year old trees. And they've got these, it's hard to see with the light, but they've got these black marks up the trunks. This is where forest fires have raged through the area, but the trees have survived. They've built themselves to be so solid, so tall, so thick, that they can survive this fire. They can, you know, survive all these big black marks. And if you look, I mean, that's a close up of one of the trees I saw. It's basically charcoal this part of this tree. But if you look up, it's green shoots at the top. The rest of the tree is surviving. And these trees actually heal round. And over the years, they heal themselves and can then survive the future fires that are coming through. And the other great thing about the forest fires is it's actually really good for the forest. And it seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? A fire raging through destroying some of the trees, damaging others, and it's great for the forest. Now what happens is when the fire comes through, it's at a fairly low level, so it, you know, it, it damages the trees at the bottom, but the heat that rises makes the pine cones open up and drop from the tree. And they drop into ash, which is a beautifully fertile soil to drop into. And they grow. And you see, within a few years, all of this amazing new growth. So what would that be like if it was for your business? If uh, when big problems happened, you could survive them, but you could use it for new growth. You could use it to regenerate your company. What would that be like? Well, let's look at some of the typical problems that we come up against. Do you recognize any of these? I think we need a quick show of hands if anyone has ever had any of this happen in their business. I'm including me here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody. Yeah. Nobody is on their own going, no, actually, I, I run the perfect business and we've never had any of that happen to us. Uh, it, it just doesn't exist. Uh, the top of the list there is, of course, all of the, the financial stuff. We undervalue our time massively all the time. Uh, we are terrible at estimating projects and we keep going into fixed everything projects. So you know, fix one, get out of fixed everything projects. Um, and also under billing, that kind of thing of, oh, well, yeah, I did work a few extra days on this or even a few extra weeks, but I don't really think I can charge for it. Don't tell the client I did it. Um, and so all the time there's this free work that's been given away. The 
But do you know what? People still expect to be paid their salary. So we've got to make sure that in the same way we respect the people that work for us and we pay them, that our clients respect us and the work we do and pay us. And we have to earn that respect, don't get me wrong, but we have to make sure that we get paid for what we do. Uh, another big problem, taking on the wrong clients, projects, that's very common. Um, here's a key one that we do all of the time in Drupal. We focus on building the sites and there's nobody focusing on building the business. Every single member in a small agency will be hacking away, developing sites or designing something or doing cool stuff. And nobody will be there doing the building of the business, the hard graft to really grow it. Then there's not knowing how you're doing. You kind of, oh, finance is boring. I don't want to look at the numbers. I don't do spreadsheets. All that kind of stuff. You need to know how you're doing all the time for the safety of your staff's jobs. One day, this will be a good motivator for you. Get all of your staff together for a party, perhaps a Saturday afternoon picnic or something, and get them to bring their families, including your kids. You stand there and look around, and you look at the children that depend on you for the home and the food, that depend on your business going well and being safe going forward. Do that, and then buckle down and check your finances and plan ahead. Have a good cash flow. Know what your profitability levels are. Know the profitability levels of each of your projects. Know that level of detail because that's what keeps the business safe. That builds your tree trunk nice and solid so that you can withstand the forest fires. And wasting time. It happens all the time, whether it's internal projects or going to clients you shouldn't, whatever it is. Look for where you're wasting time and, and learn to fix that. So here are some of the quick fixes uh, based on those. S some of these you may be able to go away and do after this Drupal camp. If there's something that kind of speaks to you that thinks, yeah, you know what, I want to do that in our business. Could be one of these, it could be something else. But do take a look at this and see is there anything that you could do in your business. Because I know with me and mine and my business partner's business, there's always stuff we're learning and we're fixing. All the time we're looking to learn key thing is, this is Michael Gerber, who did a great book years ago called The E-Myth, um, and the, the key message from it was this. As the business owner, or the business manager, your job is not to work in the business, doing the job of the business. So you shouldn't be the one building Drupal sites, or designing Drupal sites, or whatever. Your job is to work on the business. You are growing the business, establishing the business, making it safe and solid, that big, thick trunk so it will grow tall. That should be your focus. But you know what? You're really bad at it because you're stubborn. And we're like that, aren't we? All of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know that all that's important. I know that's important. But I, I, I'm better at doing this. I'm going to focus on doing this. So you sometimes have to stick to the hard stuff and do things um, just to improve the business and learn lessons. And maybe that you know you haven't always been doing it the right way. I know I haven't. I've made so many mistakes. Have you ever seen? Um, I think they have it over here as well, don't they? The Gordon Ramsay program where he goes around to different restaurants and fixes them. Do you ever see that? And so there you've got this international Michelin-starred chef, one of the most highly rated chefs in the world. He goes into a small town diner and gives them some advice. They go, nope, you're wrong. Nope, not doing that. Nope, we're not changing. Yeah, I know we're nearly out of business, but we're not changing. We're not going to do anything. So the fact is this, there's always stuff we can learn. Even if you're not at a pain point, even if your business is going great, there are so many ways to improve it all the time. Uh, so let's not be stubborn about it. So what we want to do is start a culture of sharing within the business community within Drupal. We all share code. Freely. I mean, freely. We get that. We get that it's valuable. What else could we share? What could we share about the way we run our business? So we've started open sourcing all of our processes, all of our stuff. So this is the website. It's at way.wonder.io. It's the Wonder Way. Um, and we're sharing everything. So that spreadsheet for evaluating new RFPs is up there. All of our sales process details are up there. Everything. And we're gradually putting it all up there. But we would also like to encourage other businesses to do the same. What would Drupal be like is if in the same way that a module is released, 
by one company and another company releases bug fixes and improvements to that model, what would it be like if it was the same for the way we ran our businesses? What would it be like if you know, we released a way of evaluating new sales processes and someone else, you know, Acquia, for example, or you know, uh, anyone else said, oh, actually, we've tried a different way and it worked great, here it is. So let's share stuff. So maybe think about what you can open source within your business, what you can share, what processes are working for you. So we now have 10 minutes for questions. I've reached the end of my kind of my bit. So does any is there anything anybody wants to know? We've probably got time for about four questions, maybe, depending on how long there are. Who's got the first question? This chap at the front now, please. So you've talked a lot about things like trying to maintain 20% of turnover. How, without um, not committing more than 20% of turnover to one company, how do you manage that when you're a very small company? What advice would you give to small companies? Uh, on the really large projects where it starts getting above that 20%, seek to partner with another business. Spread the risk between different agencies. I know it's tempting to go out there and grab all of the money, and you see this great big paycheck that's up there that they want to give you all of this budget but you will start to fail. It's more than you can manage as an agency. Or the, the horrible thing of, you know, you take it on and it becomes 50% of your turnover. Suddenly, the, the key contact of the client leaves, someone new comes in, and they have their favorite agency from the last job, and you're out. Your business is doomed. So um, I would say at that level, start spreading the work between different agencies. And you'll then build relationships. You'll show how collaborative the Drupal community is, uh, and you'll spread the work around. Okay. Uh, we had another hand up just here. Thank you, chap. And then you over there. What's your question? You mentioned the one to three ratio of uh, employee pay packages to revenue. How do you empower your employees to grow their pay in that metric? That is such a fantastic question because that's what we're looking at at the moment. Um, and there's a couple of things that we're looking at to enable that. One is uh, transparency, so making it very clear how everyone's pay is calculated, what the formula is, and how we approach things. But also showing how clearly it's linked through to you know, the key stuff of what clients pay us and what we're valued at. And therefore showing that the extra pay rises are available through becoming either more billable, being more productive, or by being billable at a higher rate. And that's increasing your expertise and your knowledge. So therefore, we provide you know, training and development budgets and a lot of you know, time to go to conferences and whatever else. So therefore, it really motivates people to want to learn and to be involved in stuff uh, all of the time because then they can move up their billable rate, which increases their, their salary rate. So it's almost, in a way, like a profit share. You know, everyone benefits the more we can bill. Uh, so that's very clear. Does that seem okay as a first answer? Okay. But there's more we can learn. We're looking at this at the moment. There was a question around here. Let me check that this doesn't howl over here. I think this is a good segue to that question. Um, do you do you advertise a blended rate to your client based on the sprints that you um, tell them about? This is the day rates that you talked about, or does every person in the organization have a different rate per client? Yeah, we we don't use blended rates um, because what we want to do is demonstrate the different value of different expertise and experience. So uh, there's a reason why some people are billed out at more than other people. Um, and we want to make that very transparent to the client. But also because otherwise what, what happens is the client quickly identifies who uh, they feel has the most experience and expertise and demands more of their time. And if it, there isn't a cost associated with that, then there isn't a, you know, an incentive for balance and, you know, okay, we can see some of the smaller tasks can be done by more junior people and the senior tasks done by these people. So you want to make it very transparent for the client because, um, A, that's a key principle of ours, the transparency, but then they can make decisions. So they can say, okay, well, our budgets have been cut, so therefore this really senior person, we see the value, but for a couple of, you know, the next few sprints or the next, you know, five sprints, we feel that they've set up the work enough that the more junior team can continue and they can come back and audit the work later. So, yeah, we don't do blended rates. So, so I'll just repeat that. It seems like a logistical headache. Uh, not too much because you're only doing, you know, you're planning and you're billing at a, between every sprint. 
So you finish a sprint and you build what was done there, you plan the next sprint and you forecast who's going to be on the team uh, and you work that way. And we in fact even allow our clients to fire as a commander of a sprint if they want to. We don't have long tie-ins. We only want clients to be tied into us by being happy because otherwise it's a nightmare to deal with. So, um, so yeah, it's not an admin headache. It's billing you know, by the sprint makes things a lot more simple in some ways. Uh, we have a question just back here, gentleman here. Wonderful presentation, sir. I, I was wondering if you can probably give a couple minutes overview on how you guys got started, how long you've been in business, when you adopted Drupal, and so forth. Well, a couple of minutes is a challenge because there's quite a history. I'll give a real snapshot of you. Um, uh, Wonderkraut uh, was the name of the company that was merged. It was announced at DrupalCon Munich uh, two and a half, nearly three years ago, and it was the merger of four of Europe's key Drupal agencies. And each of those had been uh, working, well, had been running for about four or five years. So there was a long history between each of the four. We brought all four together. Vesa Pamu is the CEO, and he's the guy that did the deal and brought everybody together. And at the time of the merger, I came on to open up a new office uh, in the UK uh, and start building our consultancy work as well. So I've been involved since the, the, the group was formed, as it were. So that's a very brief pop history. We've always used Drupal. Uh, Drupal is our thing, but these days we don't bill ourselves as just a Drupal shop because we're about the process as much as we're about the technology and about the communication. Okay, thank you. One more final question and then we'll wrap up. We'll go around this side. I feel like Jerry Springer. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, where was the hands uh, here? You. What, what kind of expectations do you put on your employees in terms of hours worked you know, every day and vacations and things? and do you uh, solicit their uh, advice and time for consulting quotes and things like that? Uh, well, that's quite actually quite a complex question for me to answer about us, because one of the things that we do uh, is we try and be as management light as possible. So there is we're a very very flat organisation. Um, so all of our management team are you know very close to the actual day-to-day -day doing of the business. There's no kind of big hierarchy in a, a big office somewhere in a volcano headquarters. Um, but um, in, in terms of the, uh, the question was kind of about uh, empowering the employees, is that right? Yeah, the hours. Okay. Yeah, um, so what we tell our clients is that a, a, a day is effectively seven hours uh, for us because there's always an hour of sorting out other stuff and calls and things like that. Um, and um, but employees, when they're, you know, are really responsible for their own time. So in a sprint, you're agreeing and you're committing to the work that you're doing. And we care more about the work that gets done rather than when it gets done or where it gets done. So we operate with distributed teams. We're in ten countries uh, across Europe. Um, uh, with very distributed teams, and it doesn't really matter exactly when they work or where they work, as long as things get done and the client is happy with the result. So there's a huge amount of flexibility to self-manage for every member of our team, and that's one of the things they really value and why we're able to attract some very good candidates because of that, that power. No, we don't track in that way. So, for example, we're selling by the day. We just, you know, it's just a by the day thing. All that we care about is results. We do not care about is someone in the office at nine in the morning and are they there until five or six? We had one client, uh, actually it was a large US company, that said to us, well, I will want to know that your developers are at a desk 10 hours a day working for us. And we're saying, well, I, I'm sorry, but they won't be. <laughs> you know, 10 hours a day, people get burnout. Uh, you are not getting the best productivity out of people. And in fact, in the UK, on the UK team, we do only four days a week client work and one day a week training, development, developing our tools, our systems, uh, working in the Drupal community, all that sort of thing. So that's what enables Lewis Nyman, who's one of our UK team, to do a lot of work for Drupal 8. He's the CSS lead maintainer and doing a lot of front-end work. So a lot of people are doing contributions like that. So four days a week is billable in the UK. And clients love that because on Friday they get to rest and catch up with what's happened. Because a motivated smart team actually works damn fast and damn hard. And if they're having to do evenings and weekends, there's a problem. And you don't want the work to keep out and hide a problem. You want the problem to be surfaced. 
So no, we don't manage and track time to a really precise level. We track work done. Okay, that is all the time we've got for questions. Uh, if there's anyone else who wants to ask anything, I'll wait up the front for a little bit. But let me check how we're doing. Oh, my goodness. It is five seconds to the end of the slot. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>